We're in a series at the moment looking at Jesus and uh, how we can be more like Jesus. And one of our convictions as a church is if we can see Jesus more clearly in all of his beauty and majesty and grace and courage, that will transform us and shape our lives in a hugely positive way. And if we can hold out the kind of unfiltered, unvarnished Jesus to our friends, our family, our city, to this world, people will be captivated by him. And today we're looking at uh, Jesus and success and failure. And I don't know how you find it, it seems like we live in a culture which is fascinated with success, finding success, achieving success, projecting success. We celebrate those who are successful. In one sense, we're sometimes at risk of worshipping those who are successful. And the danger is, if we live in a culture that worships success, we can find that we are frozen, almost paralysed by a fear of failure. And I think that sometimes we can just take on that. We can just absorb it from the culture in which we live. Because we want to be successful. We want to make a difference with our lives. And yet we might wonder sometimes about what true success looks like. Like we don't want to spend the whole of our lives climbing the ladder to realise that it's leaning against the wrong wall. And we might, like other people, fear failure. And yet we know in our heart of hearts that failure teaches us things that success never will. And actually, in truth, failing is as much a part of our lives as breathing. So we're going to see in this passage how Jesus approaches um, and helps his followers to approach success and failure. Uh, How he speaks of the success of failure and the failure of success. How he reframes both in a way that might give us perspective when we're doing really well and things are going as we longed for them to go and give us courage when things are hard. How we might avoid being seduced by success and how we might avoid being frozen by failure. And the first thing we see in this passage is that Jesus promises to us both success and failure. In this passage, Jesus sends out the 72. He appoints them and he sends them out to make a difference in the world. He says, the harvest is plentiful, the workers are few, so pray for more workers and go. Heal the sick, tell people about me, tell people about what's happening, show people and tell people that the kingdom of God is near and my rule and reign, Jesus' rule and reign, is breaking through. And the 72 have been selected by Jesus, they've been sent by Jesus, and like all good coaches, he gives them a little pep talk before they go, like pump them up, get them ready, you know, you can do this well, you know, it's going to be great. Uh, And there's lots of that, he talks about the urgency, he talks about the importance, he talks about how much people need to hear what they have to say, but then it's also a slightly unusual pep talk, because Jesus Uh, is completely clear with them about the challenges they're going to face. He says, I'm sending you out as lambs amongst wolves. He's like, yes. And you're like, wait a minute, that doesn't sound so good. And, you know, it's going to be really difficult and there's going to be really challenging things. And it all sounds a bit dangerous and a little bit complicated. You can imagine the disciples all pumped, ready to go. And then suddenly they're like, wait wait just a minute. Um, Really? Now? Is this what you're asking us to do? And it's almost as if Jesus wants them to know that just because he is sending them and they're obedient to him sending them. He's called them. He's commissioned them. It doesn't mean that it's going to be easy. They can be sent by him and be obedient to him. And it doesn't mean they're guaranteed 100% success. They're going to have some wins, but they're also going to face some real losses. And Jesus wants them to be prepared. He doesn't want them to be naive. You know, they're being sent into a place of high stakes, They're being sent into contested ground. Jesus says the harvest is plentiful. There is so much potential, so much that can happen, so much good stuff to come. But that means that there will be challenge and pushback. Jesus says some people will receive you with peace, which sounds great. And some people will try and destroy your peace, which doesn't sound quite so great. He says some people will welcome you with open arms. And some people will effectively shut the door in your faces. Even though you're trying to bring good news and you want to bring healing to people's lives, some people will give thanks for you and some people are going to reject you. You're going to 
face success and failure together. And sometimes when we hear God's voice and we feel like he's asked us to do something and maybe sent us to do something and we've got an idea or a project or a business or a relationship or something that's starting off and we say, right, I've heard this, God, I'm going to respond to it. I'm going to be obedient to you. We can run into the risk of thinking that means that we will then face unending, nonstop, wonderful success. And I have faced that at times in my life. I once was doing some work on an app that helped people Uh, read the Bible. And I thought, well, you know, God is just going to pour out his blessing on this app because it's helping people to read the Bible. And it's good that people read the Bible. God wants people to read the Bible. It's his Bible. Like, so this is going to be really easy. And I remember I I was kind of pitching to the team and I said, there's a few things we need to do because the app had grown really quickly over a very short space of time. And it's it's kind of back end. It's kind of developing uh, coding, all that sort of stuff was like as fragile as a shanty town. And so the more people who were joining this app, the more it was creaking around the edges. So I said, let's reboot the whole app, got some funding for it, got the team together, we had a vision, all was there, we, we rolled, we started to, you know, introduce, um, like all apps, if you've ever worked on that, you have a beta version. So in the background, you have your beta version where you're testing, and you would never roll out the app to everyone without having tested it for a long time in beta. And that's just what you do. And uh, so that's what we decided to do. And they'd said, look, we'll send you, Steve, the beta version so that you can test it for a few months before we go live on the 1st of January. I said, great, brilliant. So they sent it through to my uh, phone. And uh, it was actually, uh, it was the day I was off. And so for the first time in a few months, Beth and I were just having a coffee in, like, in a nice relaxed environment just enjoying this conversation. And then my phone started ringing and I said, hi. They said, Steve, we've got a little problem. And I said, how little? Because I'm just in the middle of something like that. They said, well, not so little that you don't want to be on it right now. And so I said, okay. So I came, I came into the office. I said, what's the problem? How bad can it be? They said, well, you know when we said we were going to have a really small group of people uh, to test the beta version? I said, yes. And they said, it's best if we put it like this. That was going to be you and me. And I said, yeah. And they said, instead, it's everyone. And I said, what do you mean? They said, well, we accidentally uploaded the beta app to replace the existing app. So there is no existing app now. Everyone's just using the beta. And I was like, that sounds serious. And they said, it is very serious, yeah. And I said, well, how do you know? They said, we've had emails from all over the globe, and they're just coming in more and more. I was like, what, are people upset? They said, yeah, it turns out if you stop people reading the Bible, when they're committed to it, they get really, really cross with you. I said, I'm not surprised. And they said, but don't worry, let's reframe it. Just imagine we didn't have the existing app, We've just launched a new app today. Hooray! I was like, that doesn't help me. It doesn't help me at all. And the whole day, it was just a nightmare. Calls, trying to fix it, trying to set it. Everyone was phoning, saying, why has my app gone crazy? Why has this gone crazy? The emails, goodness me, the emails from Christians, you know, from around the globe. <laughs> you would not believe it. It's a free app. Chill out. You know. <laughs> and I came back that night. I was like, this is an absolute disaster. It's like, God, what are you playing at? You want people to read the Bible? Why are you making my life so difficult? I'm trying to help you. (laughs) But when you're involved with something that's significant or something that matters, you're going to face success and failure. Partly that's just because life how, how life is. Partly because you're in contested ground. It matters. And every step you take into contested ground is contested. There'll be pushback. There'll be problems. And Jesus doesn't want his disciples to think that it's just going to be a glory run. He wants them to know they're going to face success and failure. And you've, I'm sure, like me, experienced a sense of failure. The gap between how we thought it would go and how it actually went. You know, when the initiative doesn't work out, when we're passed over for an opportunity, when the project blows up, when, you know, our business is struggling for cash, when you're criticised unfairly and it doesn't feel kind. It can feel like a blow. You can feel winded, especially if you're not anticipating it. But when you start to step out of your comfort zone, when you start to be open about your faith, when you start to maybe invite people to Alpha, when you start to talk about your faith with your friends or your family or your colleagues, you can hit some turbulence. And if you're not expecting it, when someone mocks you or you know, someone rejects you, you can start to doubt yourself. You can start to doubt God's call. Jesus doesn't want you to be surprised. Success and failure are part of the package. They come with the turf. And what Jesus does here is he almost frees his disciples from the fear 
of failure. He says, expect it, don't take it personally, keep on going, don't let the rejections and the disappointment keep you from helping those who desperately need your help. So Jesus says, dust yourself off. Years before Taylor Swift, he said, you know, shake it off. He's like, you know, just shake it off. Shake off the disappointment. Shake off the failure. Dust off the dust from your shoes. Don't stop. Keep going. You're going to face failure. You're going to face success. Don't be surprised by either. And don't let either stop you in your tracks. Sometimes if you fear failure, you can try and insulate your life from all risk of failure. And if you do that, you'll end up insulating your life from joy, actually. Because there's a joy that's only found on the other side of risk. There's a joy that's only found on the other side of stepping out of the comfort zone. There's a joy that's only found when you've risked success and failure in the pursuit of a greater aim. Jesus doesn't want you to miss out on that joy. And he warns his disciples they're going to face success and failure. But the second thing we see in this passage is Jesus redefines failure. It's fascinating. I love that Jesus is not phased by failure. He says, whoever listens to you, listens to me. Whoever rejects you, rejects me. But whoever rejects me, rejects him who sent me. Jesus says they're going to face rejection. But that rejection in the midst of their obedience isn't like a real failure at all. And he doesn't want them to be unduly affected by it. And so, so often it's easy to base our identity on our activity. So the things we do, the things we spend our lives doing are the things we draw our identity from. So our careers, our roles, maybe our families, maybe our positions, maybe our status, maybe our wealth, maybe the value of our name, maybe our reputation. We kind of build our identity on the foundation of our activity. And the challenge with that is that it means your identity is always going to be vulnerable to how well your activity is going. If, if your identity is achieved by you and not received from God, you know, successes will grow your sense of identity, but failures will hugely undermine your sense of identity. I've experienced this in my life. I worked as a lawyer for many years, and I loved... At first... I was very clear about why I wanted to be a lawyer. I wanted to bring the justice of Jesus into the criminal justice system. And uh, I had a very clear vision about that, felt called to do that, it's what I aimed to do. Um, but then I realized quite soon you can earn quite a lot of money doing that, which is good. And, um, and then I actually realized I quite liked winning, just generally as a human being. And so like, I obviously wanted to bring the justice of Jesus into our criminal justice system as long as I could win every single case. That was kind of the kind of, you know, and it started to become more, more I love to be successful. And you know, it became ridiculous. You know, I did one case where, um, uh, I don't think you're here today, uh, where, uh, where the person had, you know, 35 kilos of drugs in the back of their car and the police stopped them and the drugs were just in the back of the car. And then they raided the houses and they found like drug factories in the houses that this person owned. And, um, and then they found that they had actually also committed the offence of importing drugs numerous times in the past. And, um, and I was desperate to get this person off. I said, like, you've got to win. I prayed to get him off. You know, when the jury went out, I was like, Lord, would you give me success so that your justice might come into the criminal justice system? And the jury were hung for like a long time. I was like, oh, this is exciting. We might win against the head. That will really help me feel successful. And then they convicted him. Of course they convicted him. <laughs> I was so upset. It's ridiculous. I remember explaining to my colleague, I said, I lost, really disappointing. It started to really affect me. One case I did, a really big case, it went sideways in the space of a week. I remember just everything that could possibly go wrong went wrong with this case. And just sitting in my office and feeling like waves of failure just fall over me as I sat at my desk. Just another, oh, this has gone wrong. Now this has gone wrong. Now this has gone wrong. I remember. I was so disappointed. I got the bus home because it would take twice as long. Because I didn't want to have to explain to Beth how bad my day had gone. When I got home, I had two bowls of ice cream. I was so upset. I mean, it was like... But, and and the, the, as the week went on, I felt more and more depressed. 
And what I realized was, I wasn't just experiencing failure in one case I was working on. This was actually undermining my sense of who I was. Because I'd started to build my identity on my career and success in my career, as that started to be kind of chipped away at, it was almost like my sense of self was being destroyed. I had this sick feeling. I actually felt like ashamed. It was one day I thought, I don't really want to go into the office in case I see someone and they ask how the case is going. And I was thinking, wait a minute, if I feel ashamed just because a piece of work hasn't gone very well, then maybe I'm placing slightly too much of my identity in my career. And Jesus says, if they reject you, they're rejecting me, but actually they're rejecting him who sent me. He doesn't want to let disappointments and losses touch your sense of identity. I mean, look at Jesus. In one sense, he wasn't very successful. There's a huge value in our culture for work and career, and there's lots that good, is good about that. But uh, Jesus you know, was a carpenter for a while. Don't know if he was very good at that. You know, don't know if when he sold tables, they were like, this has been carved by the hands of God. I don't know. He doesn't really record it in the Gospels. But then he was a rabbi, and uh, as, as a religious leader, in one sense, he wasn't very good at it. He wasn't very successful. You know, most people he spoke to rejected him. Uh, his, his talks weren't always very easy to follow, a little bit confusing. Uh, most people didn't really get what he was on about. Uh, he spoke in riddles quite a lot of the time. Uh, gave talks sometimes, John 6, which actually meant he lost more followers than he gained. You can imagine Peter coming up to him after John 6 and saying, Jesus, speaking just isn't your primary gift. I mean, it's just not. I mean, like... Focus more on the miracles. People like those. Or when you heal people, they really love that too. But when you speak, not so much. So just, just tone down the talks a little bit. He was criticized by so many people. He was called evil. He was undermined. People plotted against him. He had enemies on every single side. The world, and often the church at times, overvalues relationship status. Jesus never married. Jesus never had children. We can judge people on the company. They keep their friends. Jesus' friends were not great. They all deserted him in his hour of need. Some of them actually betrayed him. His life, in all sorts of ways, actually looked like a failure. And people could have said and did say to him, Jesus, you're messing this up. You know, life just seems to be one failure after the other. But when you look at Jesus in the Gospels, he is always relaxed. He never seems troubled. There are so many opportunities for Jesus. As, as other leaders do, you know, it's so, many, so many opportunities for people to say, you know, as other leaders do, like, oh, well, well, I'll trade ultimate success for short-term appearance. You know, I, I, I'll, I'll trade it. I won't worry too much about what's going to happen in the future. I'll just try and be successful in the short term. I just want to avoid the appearance of looking like a failure. But he doesn't do that. Jesus doesn't identify with temporal success and he doesn't take apparent failures personally. They reject you, they reject me, but actually they're rejecting the one who sent me. Jesus' identity is completely rooted in his father. He's heard his voice at his baptism. This is my son, whom I love, in whom I'm well pleased. For Jesus... Success is obedience to his father. Failure is disobedience to his father. There's no such thing as true success for Jesus outside of his father's will. And there's no such thing for Jesus as true failure within his father's will. In everyone else's eyes, it might have looked as though he was a failure. But Jesus was obedient to his father and therefore he knew he couldn't fail. He completely redefines what failure looks like. But then he also redefines success. The disciples return from their trips and they are absolutely buzzing. They say, even the demons submit to us in your name. It's amazing. We're nailing it, Jesus. We're smashing it. And he replies, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions, overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. He's like, yes, yes, I know it's going to be great at times. 
But don't rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. It's like, yes, you've experienced huge success, but don't rejoice in that. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. It's good to enjoy success. It's good to celebrate. It's good to cheer each other on. When amazing things happen, it's great to high-five each other and just say, this is wonderful. We're so excited about it. We want to take joy in that. But Jesus sees how quickly we tie our joy to our achievement and our success. You know, if I succeed in that job, if I succeed in that exam, if that guy likes me, if that girl likes me, then I'll be joyful, Jesus. I promise I will. Jesus knows if your joy is tied to your achievements, it would always be limited by them. If your sense of significance lies in your success, it will fall apart when you fail. If your identity is built on your victories, it will be dismantled by your defeats. Jesus doesn't want you to build your identity to base your joy on things that come and go. Don't base your success on your temporary circumstances. Base it on your eternal significance. He says, don't rejoice that the Spirit submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. It's easy to spend your life trying to make a name for yourself. I think there's been times in my life where I really wanted to make a name for myself. And in some ways, it's not necessarily coming from a bad place. God has put eternity into the hearts of people. So there's something in us that God has put there that longs for an eternal impact, that longs for a legacy. It's why I think there are so many buildings and organizations with people investing tens of millions of pounds just to put their name on something, on a library or a station or a park bench, just to have something that outlasts them. Something that can be pointed to when their days are done and say, well, that was an impact I made. It's not necessarily a bad thing. But you can trust Jesus with your reputation. You see, Jesus can raise you up in a moment. The Spirit can breathe on an idea, on a business, on a strategy, on a relationship, even on a word you speak in your office or with your friends or your family. Jesus can use tiny things to transform the destiny of millions of people. I would encourage you, you want to make an impact, you want to make a success for Jesus, just entrust your plans to him. Lay them before him. Say, Lord, this is what I long to do for you. Would you help me? Would you breathe on these things? Would you fan them into flame? And then let go of them. Don't hold on to them. Don't base your joy in them. Take a step back. And rejoice that your name is written in heaven. You see, Jesus has already lifted your name higher than you could ever raise it. Higher than you could ever imagine. He's endowed your name with a significance that is greater than anything you could spend a lifetime building. He's called you by name. He's commissioned you by name. He's lifted your name, your actual name, into heaven. Remember once I was at an event... um, many years ago with the former Bishop of London and I'd only met him once before and he's, he was quite an imposing character and uh, I, I, I wasn't sure if he'd known me, I had no reason he would have remembered me so I kind of went up to him and I, I said, oh, um, uh, hi Bishop, um, uh, I just thought I should say hi, um, uh, my name is, he said, I know who you are, <laughs> I said, what is it? you're Stephen, I said, yes I am, he said, I know who you are, why do you think you have to introduce yourself to me? And um, I was like, I just thought, well, I didn't say, might have forgot. You know, it's a lot of people. Sometimes I think, you know, when I get to heaven, it's going to be a little bit awkward. Hi, God. <laughs> you, know, um, you probably don't know who I am, but um, I, was, I knew some people who you might have known, and I lived in some places you've probably heard of. Just wanted to say hi, I'm here. Hopefully my name's on the list. You know. <laughs> Can I come in? You have to almost introduce yourself to God. But you don't. Because if you know Jesus, if you've placed your trust in him, your name is written in heaven right now. 
And it's not just kind of scribbled like graffiti in some corner, like in the loos. <laughs> Sometimes I think that's the best I can hope for. If my name's up there somewhere, some angels scribbled it in the loos. Do you know what it means? In the Old Testament, only the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies. And as he did so, he would wear on his chest, on these metal blocks, the names of the tribes of Israel. He would enter into the Holy of Holies with the names of the people on his heart. And Jesus is our high priest, and because of the blood shed on the cross, because of what he has done for us, because it seemed he had failed beyond all failing, yet because God gave him success beyond all success, through him you can approach the throne of God boldly. You can lay your plans before God boldly. You can speak to him knowing he will hear you as a much-loved daughter, as a much-loved son. And you can seek him with your desires and ask him to bless them with success. You can know that as Jesus approaches the Father, as he does now, he wears your name on his heart. He carries your name on his heart. Your name is engraved in the highest place by Jesus. And that changes things. That means you can take risks today, bet the farm, go all in for the kingdom of God, speak to people at work, start a new project, start a new venture, start a new company, take a risk. Because you don't have to fear failure when your name is already held in the highest place. It means you can enjoy success without it seducing you and gripping you. It means you can face failure without it crushing you. And it gives you boldness to go through this life full of faith, confident, and without fear. And what I love is that that gives great joy to Jesus. It says here, this only time in the whole of the Gospels that this phrase is used. At that time, Jesus, full of joy, means rejoicing in great joy. Jesus kind of living it up, relishing the moment. I imagine him shaking his head back and just laughing to the heavens and saying, isn't this fun, Father? I praise you, Father, Lord of earth and heaven, because you've hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, because this is what you're pleased to do. People spending their whole lives trying to make a name for themselves. And Jesus says, Father, isn't it amazing? We can lift their names up in a moment. They're right there now. They have a significance some of them don't even realize. Isn't that exciting? Isn't that just the best way of doing it, Father? Isn't it fun that we've done it that way? And he finds when you take confidence in that, when that gives you security, when you base your identity on that, when that gives you the foundation to take risks and to try things and to step out in faith, that gives Jesus great, overflowing, overwhelming joy. Just think of the difference we could make as we go about our jobs in our hospitals, our businesses, our colleges, our schools, our companies. Like, my name is written in heaven. This day I'll have some hard things, I'll have some great things, but my name is written in heaven. Yeah, I'm going to face some challenges this year. Yeah, there might be some bumps and scrapes along the way, but my name is written in heaven. And that gives great joy, not just to you, but to Jesus too. In Jesus' name, amen.